So I was in McDonald's the other day, and I kid you not, a koala bear walks in, eats a happy meal, pulls out a gun, shoots it in the ceiling, and then walks out. And I was like, what was that all about? And I didn't understand until I went home and looked up koala bear in the, in the Wikipedia, and it says, they eat, shoot, and leave. Um, so that's what that is all about. I know, isn't it horrible? You know, even the other day, Darlene told me, stop impersonating a flamingo. So I had to put my foot down. Okay, let's, uh, let's start off with a word of prayer. We've been talking about prayer, and um, I want us to just take a few minutes and start off by having a word of prayer. Let's do that. Let's take uh, 15 seconds. I see funny things up here. That's, that's, let's take 15 seconds, and let's just pray right now. Just ask God to open your heart, your mind, your spirit. Let's pray. Oh, gracious God, it is you that has invited us into relationship. It's you that desires to communicate to us and commune with us, and you're the one that said, call upon me and I will answer you and show you great and mighty things. And so, Lord, as you help us develop a life of prayer and a mind and a heart that continually turns to you in prayer, we pray that our relationship would deepen with you in every way. In Jesus' name, amen. So, um, anybody got a testimony of something that's really cool? We had a big altar call here last week, and uh, people were prayed for. Anybody got a testimony, something that God's done in your heart, something God's done in your life? I know he's moving, but... Yes? My name just came back from surgery. I was surgery. Yes, Dottie uh, Delorier had a carotid artery that was getting... Uh, blocked up, and so they had to go in and open that up. She is home doing better, and now Bob's not only the only pain in the neck that she's got. She's got another one, too. <laughs> yes? Absolutely. Let's pray. I know Bob told me that uh, she was experiencing some headaches and things like that. So, Father, we just pray that this isn't anything serious, that this is just a normal recourse of having that artery open to its fullest and uh, uh, her, her brain receiving that full flow of blood. Lord, we just pray that you'd keep your hand upon her, that you are healing her. You're her deliver her, your salvation. You are her healer, Jehovah Rapha, and we thank you for these things. Sustain her and cause this um, surgery, this incision to heal over and heal up quickly, that she'd be back on her feet and back about the normal routine of her day. And we thank you for these things. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Prayer. God answers prayer. I mean, I don't know how I can put much more of a finer point on that. God answers prayer. So um, I just want to give you like a heads up of what I feel like the Lord has laid on my heart to steer us in for the next few weeks um, leading up to and including Easter. So um, we have uh, three weeks on prayer, and we've been talking about this flag and appeal to heaven, and I'll mention that in just a minute. Um, but we've had three weeks on prayer. This will be the last week on prayer. Then we're going to transition. We're going to have a couple of weeks on the presence and the person of the Holy Spirit. It's so important in the life of a Christian. We don't hear a lot about the Holy Spirit. And then one week on evangelism. And our brother shared how just out in public, just sharing, you know, your faith, and it stirs some up, but it, it opens other people's hearts. And he said this woman kind of came out of the background and said, hey, I believe. And that's the theme that we're going with with Easter. And so the week before Easter on March 20th, we're having the Bangor Woman's Hope Home here. You're going to hear six to eight women who are bound and addicted to heroin um, Pastor Brian mentioned these 40-something uh, deaths that took place, and those weren't just overdose. I understand that those were actual fatalities, that 40-something uh, people died in Manchester with a heroin overdose. So you're going to hear the delivering power of God. And if you know anybody, family, friends, neighbors, that's wrestling with addictions, especially heroin, bring them to church that week, because you're going to hear how only the power of Christ can really set people free from those kinds of addictions, because he is our deliverer. And then on Easter, you're going to be doing a big 
big service called I Believe. And I'm working on it now, and it is going to be powerful. So again, uh, evangelistically, if you can bring somebody, th- it'll be a great message for them to hear um, and, and hopefully to believe not only in God, but in his son who was our sacrifice, Jesus Christ. And so this is kind of the direction that we're going in. So let's just jump in here now to part three on, um, on uh, prayer. And again, this flag, I put it up here because this, this flag with a single pine tree and a field of white with the words, an appeal to heaven, was the flag that flew off of the first seven schooners that were commissioned as being the United States Navy. Before we had a Navy, you know, George Washington helped fund it himself out of his own pocketbook because this was a life and death battle for independence. And um, they understood the value of independence and they, they paid dearly for it. But our Navy started with that. And these little seven schooners capturing uh, 55 British ships, uh, unheard of because they were up against such incredible odds and such uh, terrible odds. And yet they said, listen, we're appealing to to heaven. We're praying to heaven. And uh, last week we talked about that there's a a violent side of prayer, that there's a a laying hold of the promises of God and uh, stretching out to God. And, And, you know, basically we wanted to demystify prayer. That prayer is nothing more than talking with God. And talking with God equals walking with God. If I'm talking with God, I'm walking with God. And, um, and if I'm walking with God, I'm going to experience his presence. And uh, that's kind of in a direction I want to go this morning. Again, here's that most profound promise that God gives us in James chapter 4, verse 8. Draw near to me. And uh, he will draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. And so this promise that we looked at three weeks ago, it said three weeks ago, if you would draw near to God, God would draw near to you. Here we are three weeks later, and this promise still says the same thing. Uh, Because it's not going to change, because that's the power of the Word of God. As a matter of fact, tomorrow, if you open up your Bible to James 4, 8, The Word of God livingly is going to tell you, hey, if you draw near to God right now, God will draw near to you. That's a promise that's always going to be there. It's always the same. It never changes. And so it behooves us to start drawing near to God. Now, the reason why is found sort of in the Westminster Catechism. The Westminster Catechism of the Anglican Church of England said this, that the chief aim of man is to know God and enjoy Him forever. That's the reason you're here. That's the reason you live, to know God and to enjoy Him forever. That's our goal. That's the whole purpose in you being created, to have fellowship with the Father God. And it's so important. We say, you know, well, why is that so important? Look at this scripture. Um, Lamentations chapter 3, verses 22 and 23. It says, the Lord's loving kindness never ceases. The Lord's loving kindness never ceases. Now, You can be kind to somebody, but it doesn't necessarily mean you're going to be lovingly kind to them. You can change somebody's flat tire along the road and be kind, but it doesn't mean that you're doing it really out of like a a love. But if it was your kid or if it was your grandfather or grandmother that was stranded, you would not only be kind, but you would be loving kind. There would be that relationship. And this is what it says, that God's loving kindness never ceases His compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. So God's mercy is new every morning. This morning when you woke up and slid out of bed, boom, there was a new dose of mercy God was giving to you for today. Now, it's not like I'm going to give you a rose today and then a new rose tomorrow, and another rose the next day, and another rose the next day, and another rose the next day. That's not the way this means because the the Hebrew word is hadas. And hadas means something new that is completely different. So it'd be like if you got a rose today, and you got a carnation the next day, and you got a sunflower the next day, and you got a tulip the next day. You're, it's, it's something that you're getting brand new every single day. So God this morning, out of his treasures to you, is giving you mercy in a new and different way never experienced before. And his mercies is what helps us endure tough times, because tough times come, and trust me, tough times are coming again. 
I mean, if you follow the news, if you just, you know, just touch base, and I don't mean become like a news hound, but if you just look at what's going on, you know that this, things are tough. And, and one of the things is, is not only is the world crazy, but our flesh is crazy, isn't it? And we have to fight that fight. Jack Hayford says that one of the hardest things to learn is to make decisions against yourself. Sometimes you have to make decisions against yourself because yourself wants to do this or do that. And you have to make decisions that are contrary or against your flesh. Jesus put it this way. He said, hey, deny yourself. Take up your cross and follow me. And the reason being is because the Bible still says this in 1 Corinthians 10, all things are lawful, but not all things are profitable. So, you know, our body is made up of a skeletal frame and a muscle frame. And, you know, in, in, our, in our body, one of the strongest muscles is the heart. The heart just pumps a phenomenal amount of blood over miles of uh, arteries and, and vessels and veins and capillaries and all of that kind of stuff. But, you know, a muscle that's even more important than the heart is our no muscle. Our no muscle when we actually have the right to say no to something or something. And that's so important. And if you've ever tried to lose weight, you know what that no muscle is like. It ain't easy, is it? Because people said if it was easy, everyone would be doing it. And it isn't easy. A couple of years ago, I lost like 50 pounds and it was just like, no, 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 no. I just kept saying no. And then after a while, it was like I lost so much weight and I was doing so good. I thought, well, you know, hey, one devil dog's not going to hurt, you know. And then, ooh, look at that apple pie. That ain't bad. And I ended up putting like half of it back on again. And so now I'm back into, no, I've got to say no and change my lifestyle and say no to things. You have to say no to sex outside of marriage. Amen. Boom. That's just wrong. And you have to say no to that. You have to say no to drinking too much. You know, maybe you have a beer, maybe you have a wine or something like that. You know, I just saw a report the other day that said millennials, the younger generation, are the largest wine-consuming generation in the history of the world. Millennials today. And maybe you say, well, dude, I just got to have a glass of wine to, un to unwind and relax. Well, that's cool. You know, I'm not God's policeman. I that's fine. But you know what? If you're drinking like a bottle a night and you're going to bed buzzed, maybe that's not healthy. Maybe that's just too much. Maybe that's wrong. And maybe you just need to start saying no to yourself. And that's what, that's what he's saying. Because, you know, there are things in our lives that, hey, it may be lawful, but it's not profitable. There was a fig tree that was unprofitable. It wasn't producing. And what did Jesus do? Jesus cursed it. And there's things in your life that aren't producing that aren't good things, and maybe you need to just curse those things. And you say, well, pastor, well, you know what? I just have like a beer or a glass of wine to, to relax and unwind. Hey, I understand that. That's fine. I under That's cool, right? But if it's night after night after night that you need that to relax, then now it's become a medication. Now it's become a medication. And you're not looking to God to do something that God can do for you. All right? So, so this is what he's talking about using. Uh, and, and right now you're sitting there, Pastor, I don't really like this preaching. It's not fun. Listen, this is called conviction. And let me just say something about conviction. Because we're talking about talking with God. If you do not want to hear the conviction of God's voice, you will never hear the comfort of God's voice. Because it's a package deal. God talks, and we hear, and we listen, and we obey, and it's, and it's just a package deal. And let me just say something else. God doesn't text. God doesn't text. God speaks. He's a living God, and he speaks. And in order to speak, you have to be in a person's presence. And God is omnipresent, and he's everywhere all the time, isn't he? So God speaks to us as we're in his presence. Now, there's two groups of people that seek the presence of God. One group is just those who seek him for what he can do for them and for an easy life versus another group who seeks him because of who he is. He's God. His presence is glorious. You know, the Bible says, taste and see that the Lord is good, right? And so, you know, sometimes you go to a restaurant and you try a new food and you're like, you know, I don't know. And you're like, wow, that's really good. It tastes really good. Well, when you taste and see you will see that God is really, really good. And so let's look at these two groups. They're actually displayed in the life of Moses and the children of Israel. And so let's just go through this. You know, the children of Israel are, are captive. They're captives in Egypt. 
They're slaves in Egypt. They're under the lash. They're under the whip. They're under taskmasters that are making them build all of the great things in, in, in Egypt, the pyramids, all this stuff. You know, these slaves are the one that's doing all that work. For hundreds of years, they're crying out to God saying, I thought our patriarch Abraham said that we had our own land and that we were going to be multiplied and that we are going to, you know, here we are slaves. Blah, blah, blah. And finally, all of a sudden, God gets Moses, sends Moses to them with the good news, and this is how they respond to that. In Exodus 4, 31, it says, so the people believed, and when they heard that the Lord was concerned about the sons of Israel, and that he had seen their affliction, and they bowed down and worshiped. Moses comes to the children of Israel, and he says, God has called me, God has laid on my back the burden and the responsibility to be your deliverer, and to see you free, and to see you out of Egypt. And they bow down and they worship God. They're like, this is awesome. We're finally going to get freedom. We're going to get a new life. We're going to get a new land. The only problem with that is Pharaoh didn't quite see it the same way. And so Pharaoh doubles their workload and takes straw away from them. And he makes their life really, really difficult. Now listen. God's mercy hadn't changed. His mercy his loving kindness is new every morning. So one morning they woke up and Pharaoh said, I ain't putting up with this. It didn't mean that God's mercy had changed, did it? No, his mercy was still there. They just didn't feel it. They didn't sense it. They couldn't see through their eyes what God was doing. And so all of a sudden they're under taskmasters, and this is how they respond in Exodus 5.21. They said, may the Lord look upon you, Moses, and judge you, Moses, for you made us odious in the sight of Pharaoh and in the sight of his servants to put a sword in their hand to kill us. Listen, one minute they're bowing down and they're worshiping God, thanking for sending Moses. The next minute they're like, Moses, you know, I hope God judges you and kills you. You ever feel that way sometimes? You're like, I hope God judges you and kills you. You know, <coughs> I know I don't, but I know sometimes that you might. So, and this is what's happening. And, and, and all of a sudden, it's like they're, they're, they're literally calling down a sentence of judgment on Moses for what's going on. God intervenes, and what happens? Signs and wonders that would blow your circuit boards. I mean, you know, the plagues of frogs and lice and fire and hail and darkness and all these things start assailing Egypt. And then the death of the firstborn and Pharaoh's like, fine, just get out of here. And they take the gold and the silver and they leave and, and they're just, they're filled with joy and they're carrying all this wealth and they're like, they're at a high time, man. They're living life and they leave Egypt and it's all good. And then they come up to the Red Sea. And they're faced with a sea in front of them, mountains on either side, and the Egyptian army is closing in on the rear. And they're stuck. Now see, they didn't know tactics. Moses should have divided them in half, put them in the mountains, perfect ambush, open up with 50 cows, get an AK tank killer to go in there and strafe them a couple times. Done deal. But you know, they didn't have that kind of stuff. So, so it's just they're panicking. And, and now they're up against the Red Sea, and, and what are they going to do now? Because here comes the armies of Egypt, and this is what they say in Exodus 14, verse 11. They said to Moses, is it because there's no graves in Egypt that you have taken us away to die in the wilderness. We have, uh, why have you dealt with us in this way, bringing us out of Egypt? Now, I want you to see what's happening because God is doing something phenomenal in their midst. But as soon as it goes bad, it's their leader's fault. And they're like, you know, it's not God doing this. It's like, no, this isn't going bad. So Moses, you're the one that did this. Moses, why did you do this to us? And then it goes on in verse 12, and they say this. Is this not the word that we spoke to you while in Egypt saying, leave us alone? Hey, they never said that. They were like, get us out of Dodge and do it as quick as you can. Leave us alone that we may serve the Egyptians, for it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the wilderness. And now all of a sudden, they let the cat out of the bag. It would have been better for us. And they start to show the intention of their heart that their heart was just about them and their lives. And when you look at us compared to the universe, we really are kind of puny. 
in front of this massive God that is working out all things according to the counsel of his will. But there's a, there's a concern here only for self-interest, not what God's doing. They're just concerned about their life. And that's called hedonism, by the way. Hedonism is like, I don't care what anybody else does in life. It's all about me. I want to have fun. I want to enjoy my weekends. I want to do this. I want to do that. I don't care if the church has a need. I want to do this. I want to, I'm going to play. I want to blah, 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 blah. It's all about me, 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 me. And I'll tell you what, this is insidious. This comes at all of us at all kinds of different times. The other night, two nights ago or three nights ago or something like that, I wake up at four in the morning. I, you know, you, get, you reach a certain age where sleep just like messes with you. You know, just boom, wake up at four in the morning. Oh, this is great. I'm still tired, but I can just tell I'm not going to go back to sleep. But I'm going to try. So I lay there, and as I'm laying there, I pray. Because I've just learned to do that, and you know, just pray. So I'm just, I start talking to God about you all. Like, God, what are you going to do with these people? Like, honestly, goodness, you know. And, and, and God speaks to my heart. I know that sweet gentle, still, loving voice speaks to my heart as I'm praying and says, get out of bed and kneel before me. And I'm like, I rebuke you in Jesus' name. That's, that is not God, man. That is like of the devil. God's not legalistic. God wouldn't force me to do something that my flesh doesn't want to do. I'm comfy warm in these covers, Lord, you know. Come on. And I know that, you know, it's not the position of our body. It's the position of our heart. And I'm going on and on and on. And I talk myself out of being obedient. And I'll tell you what, that is how you miss God. By not having a strong no muscle that says no to yourself and, and, and making a decision against yourself. And you know what? You miss out by not being obedient because that's how we grow as followers of Jesus Christ. It's by those little tests of obedience. You know, it's like, oh, I'd like to do something great for Jesus. I'd love to win the town of Raymond for Jesus. I'd like to go preach at the high school and see the entire population of the high school get saved for Jesus. I'd like to do something big for Jesus. And Jesus says, can you get out of bed and kneel in front of my presence for a little bit? You see, if you can't do those little things, He's never going to ramp it up and take you to the bigger stuff. He just won't. He doesn't. He's very gentle. Now, you know, he didn't go from being loving and kind, and when I stayed in bed, he didn't turn into a monster with like a lightning bolt like this, like, I'm going to impale you to your pillow. You know, he didn't. But I missed an opportunity to be obedient. And who knows where those go because they snowball. They get bigger and better and more glorious to where God starts using you in a really profound way. So this is just a real insidious thing where we're almost like the children of Israel says, hey, it would have been better for me, God, if you'd never spoken to me. You know, don't put that heavy burden of whether I should get up and kneel before you. And so they start, they start grumbling against Moses because all these things are happening. And Moses comes back and he says this. He goes, listen, your grumblings aren't against us as your leaders, you know, Moses and Aaron and Miriam and the crew there. He says, you're grumbling against the Lord. You're grumbling against God. That's just the way God set it up. You can't grumble against me as the pastor. Do you do that? You're grumbling against God. I can grumble about you all I want. And that's cool. That's how it works. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. But, but, here he's saying, listen, you're grumbling against God. This is God doing this for you, and you need to understand that. So God intervenes again. God splits the Red Sea. They go across as on dry ground. The uh, armies of Egypt come in. They're destroyed. The waters cave in, back in on them. And, and the Bible says that Miriam, the sister of Moses, picks up a tambourine, and she starts dancing before God. And then the Bible says something interesting. It says, and all the women joined her. So get this picture in your mind. Here's three million people come across the Red Sea, and Miriam picks up the tambourine. Now let's just say that all things being equal, let's say half are men and half are women. So that's a million and a half women. Let's say two-thirds of those women are children. You're still talking about 500 thousand women dancing and worshiping God and playing the tambourine and hallelujah on the mountains, glory to God in the highest, and then a few days later, the food runs out. 
man, they go through their last bag of Jack Link's teriyaki beef jerky, you know, and it's like, now what's going on? And, and how are we going to handle this? And here we go again, Exodus chapter 13, or 16 rather, it says, the sons of Israel said to them, would that we had died by the Lord's hand in the land of Egypt where we sat by pots of meat and we ate bread to our full, for you've brought us out in this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. You see a pattern developing here? You see, yeah, food, man. Food's the biggest, you know, started in the garden with, you know, the burgers and everything, and don't eat the burger. And so here's, here's what's happening. They're happy when God is doing what they want. And as soon as that doesn't happen, which, let me tell you, is part of living life on planet Earth. You're never going to get what you want all the time. Life throws curveballs at us. And all of a sudden, we find ourselves in a crucible and in a trial and in a flaming furnace, and we find ourselves going through things. And this is behavior under pressure. How do we behave under pressure? And I listen, I've witnessed it. I've seen people before. I'm mad at God. Oh, wait a minute. You know, seriously? When I hear people say that, I know that they don't know God. They don't know God. Because if you knew God, you'd never say, I'm mad at God. First of all, because God's, you're mad at God, that doesn't cause him to fall off of his throne. Like he doesn't go, what am I going to do? They're mad at me. He doesn't care. He doesn't care. He gives his word. He gives wisdom. And he says, you, you know, choose life, follow me, and get on my side. And things, you, know, you, you just got to understand that life. You know, what did Jesus say? Jesus said it's going to rain on the just and the unjust. Well, I don't want it to rain on my life. Tough. <laughs> Tough. We've got a generation of young people coming up more and more and more and more that are more and more medicated because everything's coded. This is a code, and this is a code, and that's a diet. Listen, no, it's life. You've got to learn to deal with the downsides of life. It doesn't mean that God's mercy has stopped because the Bible tells us His mercy is new every morning. But just because His mercy is new to you doesn't mean that you're not going to go through some tough times. That's what the entire Bible is about. That's what chapter 11 of Hebrews is about, living by faith even in the tough times. That's what the life of Daniel was about. My goodness, he's living in Babylon as a follower of Yahweh. Tough, tough situation. How we are going to live life and how we're going to stand under pressure. There's a, an old African folklore that goes like this. There was a king of a tribe and he had a best friend. And the best friend was always noted for saying, this is good. No matter what happened, it was like, this is good. And it was kind of irritating. You know, you ever get around those people, you know, get a flat tire, this is good, you know. It's like, eh. And so they go hunting one day, and the king sees an animal, and he grabs a gun that his friend loaded, and as he's moving it, it goes off in his hands, and it blows his thumb off. And his friend looks at him and he goes, this is good. And he goes, it is not good. And he has him thrown in jail. A year later, the king is out hunting again by himself. He gets captured by cannibals. And they're preparing to consume him. And as they're getting him ready, they notice that his thumb is missing, and they stop everything and let him go, because in their culture, the body has to be perfectly whole before they consume it. And they let him go, and all of a sudden, he realizes that his missing thumb has saved his life. And he remembers his friend that he had thrown in prison, and he goes to his friend, and he pulls him out of prison, and he goes, I'm so sorry, I didn't understand, this is not good at all. And his friend goes, this is good. And he goes, how can it be good that you just spent the last year in prison? He goes, because if not, I would have been hunting with you, and I'm not missing my thumb. <laughs> you see, prayer leads us to the presence. 
Prayer leads us to the presence. And the Bible says in the presence of God, there's the fullness of joy. And the Bible says the joy of the Lord is our strength. And so it's all about having an attitude of gratitude, of being thankful whether things are going good or whether things aren't going good because there's a God that is overseeing everything and he has your best interest at heart. Even though it's a tough thing, he's designed it for a trial for you to go to because you're going to come out stronger, you're going to come out better. And Moses, the Bible says, ends up with this mentality um, where he says, actually, let me go back. I think I missed one. Nope, it's not in there. Oh, we missed the scripture. Okay, so Moses says, listen, he says, if your presence doesn't go with us, do not lead us up from this place. Now, look what he says. He's saying, you know what, Lord? Now, first of all, God gets so ticked off with the Israelites that he takes Moses aside and he goes, you know what? He goes, they're a bunch of pudding heads. I'm not hanging out with them anymore. I'm just going to send an angel. Now, if he had made that offer to the children of Israel, they would have been, yeah. I mean, because they were already ready to go back to Egypt without God, without angels, without anything. They wanted to go back to Egypt. So if, if God would have told them, I'll send an angel and bring you to the promised land, they would have been, yeah. But Moses says, No. No, if your presence isn't going to go with us, don't lead us up from here. Now, wait a minute. Where was here? They're in the desert, man. They're in a desert, and Moses is saying, don't lead us up from here. What's in deserts? Hardships. No gardens, no natural resources, no security, no homes, no rivers, no vineyards, no trees, nothing. In a desert, and Moses is saying, listen, if you're not going with us, I'd rather stay in the desert with you. Because he understands the presence of God. I mean, God can make deserts bloom. And he's saying, I, I'm not, I'm not going to do this. See, and this is what happens with Moses. Hebrews tells us that by faith, when he had grown up, he refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. Choosing. Everybody say Choosing choosing rather to endure ill treatment with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin. Moses chooses the hard road because that might be the road that God's on. And I would rather be on the hard road with God than on the easy road without him. And then it goes on and it says, he considered the reproach of Christ now listen, Moses, wasn't, Moses and Christ are two different, you know, separated by hundreds and hundreds of years. But it's Christ all through the entire story of the Bible. And he understood, and he says, I would rather be reproached for Christ than have the riches and the treasures of Egypt, for he was looking to another reward. See, there's a different kind of reward here. It says, by faith, he left Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, and he endured. Now, here's the secret. He endured. Are you going to go through hardships? Yes. Is life going to throw you curveballs? Yes. You endure as seeing him who is unseen. You endure because of a faith that gives you the victory in the world. You see, there is something better out there. Don't fall for the smoke and mirrors of the devil's tricks. Don't fall for the devil to say, ooh, look at this life. Ooh, look at all the pleasures of this life. Ooh, look at all the fun you can have in this life. That smoke and mirrors and it's a lie. There's something so far better out there. It transcends anything you could ever have here. It's greater, it's better, and the way we endure the reproach of Christ. Now listen, let's just be perfectly honest. If you're going to live for Jesus, there are going to be people who won't understand that, and there will be people who will make fun of you, and there will be people who will ridicule you, reproach you, like the gentleman at, at, uh, at the Grand Canyon. They said, I don't believe that there's a God. I, I see that, and I, I see it all the time. There's just such a strong spirit of atheism, and, and it's been fueled by years of dumbing down education and the teaching of evolution as being a scientific proven fact. And I want you to know, folks, it just isn't. It's a theory. It's a theory. And it isn't even a good one. And if you really get into it and really study it and understand it, you'll find out that there's a lot of deception and lies sewn in there purposely. Just sewn in there. 
Why? Because it's the devil's world, man. And he's trying to get you off of the better thing. You know, I haven't traveled a whole lot, but I remember preaching revival services in Jamaica. I remember preaching tent meetings in India and some meetings in Romania. And I've seen some people of the world that have nothing. Their houses are built out of pallets and pieces of tin and pieces of cardboard. And that's where they live 24-7. They have nothing but the followers of Jesus. They have smiles on their face that you couldn't get off with a baseball bat. I mean, they're just internally free and happy because they are enduring as seeing something or someone that is unseen. They're enduring because of faith, and they're in a constant relationship of connectedness through this medium that we call prayer. Talking with God. Turning to God. You know what? When Goliaths come in your life, when the giants come in your life, pray. Discouragement comes in your life, pray. Depression comes in your life, pray. Fear comes into your life and wants to smother you out. Pray. Because God still answers prayer. God will show up and do phenomenal things that couldn't have been done in any other way. It's absolutely amazing. And look what, look what Moses says here. Let's go back. He says, then, then he said to him, if your presence does not go with us, don't take us up from here. And that's a powerful scripture. But let's go on into the next verses. For how then can it be known that I have found favor? Everyone say favor. favor. How will it be known that I have found favor in your sight? I and your people, is it not by your going with us that we, I, and your people may be distinguished from all the other people on the face of the earth? What is it that distinguishes us? It's the fact that God's presence is in our lives. God's presence is in our lives. There should be something about you that's different from anyone else. The presence of God is with us. And listen, you can't deny historically that the presence of God has been with the Jewish people. Because they're just smart. You know, there's a fluid in your brain if there's a fluid in your brain that every synapse that sparks an electrical current goes through that fluid to another synapse, and that's how your brain operates. And they discovered that there's a chemical compound in the minds of Jews that's heightened more than any other nationality because they're smart. I mean, hey, everywhere they go, they become doctors and lawyers and, you know, uh, uh, bankers. And so when Germany in the early 1930s when Germany elected Bernie because they wanted socialism. Okay, follow along. Because the Nazi party was a socialistic party that said, we're going to make it good for everybody. And then they started looking around and said, how are we going to do that? They looked at the Jews because the Jews were all the bankers, the lawyers, the doctors. The Jews really had the wealth of Germany because they're just blessed with favor. And they said, let's just go after the Jews and take their money and disperse it and give it to everybody else. That's socialism. Oh, my. <laughs> Dear Jesus. All right. So it's the same with you. He's saying, listen, I want to distinguish you from other people because I want my presence to be in your life. I want there to be something that you see that's unseen, that you taste that isn't there, that you feel that isn't around you. I want you to be living in a relationship with me. And this is how it translates into the New Testament in 1 Peter 2 verse 9. You are a chosen race. You're a royal priesthood. You're a holy nation, a people for God's possession. God saying, man, I want to lay my hand on you and say, you're mine. You're mine. And we lay our hand back on him and say, and you're mine. You're mine. So that you may proclaim the excellencies, that's praise and worship, of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. He called you out of being blind, stone cold, bat blind, night darkness, inky deep, into his light, 
And then he goes on and he says, for once you were not a people, but now you're the people of God. You've not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. And I want you to know that in a nation that gets evangelized and starts becoming Christian is the favor and the blessings of God. What brought us out of the dark ages? It was a revival called the Renaissance, and all of a sudden there was an explosion of creation and of art and of the Michelangelo's. I remember Darlene, was that the Dartmouth? We went to the Dartmouth Museum, the Dartmouth Museum, and you're on one floor, and here's all these Renaissance paintings. The masters, you know, Rembrandt and all these masters, and you look at the, and a lot of them are Christian-based drawings. You know, the betrayal of Jesus and the arrest of Judas and all these different things. And you look at these paintings, and they're so real. The eyes, it's almost like you can look into somebody's soul. It's like it's so real. And then you go up into the next floor into modern art, and there's this plywood 40-foot hammer called the hammer. (laughs) Yeah. Okay, and then there's this other thing that's a glob of resin with sawdust and wood chips, like somebody just dumped a big gallon of resin on their shop floor, let it dry, and then hung it up. And it's like, okay, I was looking at one piece of art for 10 minutes until I realized it was just an air register, you know? I was like, I didn't, because you didn't know anymore. It's like, you know, what's, what's, you know, it's crazy. That's why America is the greatest world superpower in the world today because it was founded by Puritans and pilgrims who were seeking God. South America was founded by the Spaniards and they were seeking gold. And look at the difference today. I tell you, you know one of the biggest cataclysmic shifts that's taking place in the world right now? is China. Because the underground church is exploding. And what's happening to China? Economically, they're becoming one of the world's superpowers. They're now the World Bank. Because the blessing of God follows the presence of God. And God is saying, draw near to me because I want to draw near to you with my presence. And where my presence is, I'm just going to bless you. It doesn't mean you're not going to have hardship. It doesn't mean you're not going to have trials. But in those trials, he's going to work out in you and through you and with you what he needs to to make you that much better of a person. And so prayer is just talking where I encounter the presence of Christ. It's so, so important that we have that presence This is what David said in the Psalms. When you said, seek my face, my heart said to you, your face, O Lord, I will seek. David understood it, that when God opens that door of opportunity, when God opens that door of invitation, and God says, hey, seek my face. When God says, hey, draw near to me. And we respond. When God says, get up and kneel before me. I'll tell you what, that very same thing happened last night. I kid you not. And I was on my knees. I just learned, you know, because you know, sometimes it's hard to learn, but you, you got to do it. You know, you just say, Lord, I need to be obedient. Let me just tell you something. The worst lie from the pit of hell that you can believe is the lie that says God is against you. God is not for you. God is against you. Because in the garden, God said, don't disobey because you'll die. And the enemy came and said, did God really say that? Did God, re- he doesn't mean that. God means what he says and he says what he means. And the Bible says, if God is for you, who can be against you? God is for you. You don't want to believe that lie that he's not against you. Listen, let me say something. God not only loves you, he likes you. And he wants to spend eternity with you. Now, see, some people think, well, God loves me because God has to love me. God loves everybody. But he's doing it kind of like with a chagrin. You know, he really doesn't want to, but he's got to because he's God. Well, he not, not, only does he not, not only does he love you, but he likes you. Now, that's amazing because I know who Ken Bossy is, and sometimes I don't even like me. Why would God like me? But he likes us, he loves us, and he wants to spend eternity with us. And that's why the psalmist said also, God is our refuge, God is our strength, a very present help in times of trouble. Because God is omnipresent.
present. That means he's everywhere. Where can I flee from your presence, the psalmist said. If I take the wings of the morning and fly out to the dawn, you're there. If I make my bed in hell, you're there. Where can we go from the Spirit of God? Nowhere, because he's everywhere all the time. But then there's this thing called the manifest presence of God. When he comes upon us, Jesus said to those who love me, the Father will manifest himself to them. And this is where we come into this presence of God that is tangible, that refreshes us, that changes us, that causes our faith to just become inflamed. You know, we sing that, we sing that song, Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus, Look Full in His Wonderful Face, and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of His glory and grace. And we take that word light and put the word presence because his presence is light. Turn your eyes upon Jesus, look full in his wonderful face, and the things of earth grow strangely dim in the presence of his light, of his glory, and his grace. Jeremiah 33. Man, you should just remember this one because it's a scripture I always stand on whenever I want to pray. I stand on this invitation, Father, You said, call upon you and you will answer me. I come before you on behalf of what your word says. Otherwise, I don't have a foot to stand on. I don't have ground to stand on. But your word says that if I call upon you, you will answer me. And so, Father, I'm calling upon you in the name of Jesus. And I just start talking, just start praying. I will tell you things. What does that mean? That means God is speaking back. God is manifesting his presence. And listen, if God created the universe with nothing more than words, then one word spoken to you in due season can radically change your life or circumstances or anything else forever. Let's pray. Jesus, as we conclude this three-part series on an appeal to heaven, I pray that your people would begin to just do that on a more frequent basis. And no one's judging no one this morning. There may be some here that haven't prayed in months, and that's cool, but Lord, I pray that they would begin to start praying. There might be here that only prayed like once a week, and that's fine, but Lord, I pray that that would move up to maybe three times a week. There's some here that probably pray daily. And I pray, God, that that would become even more. And there's some here that try to pray without ceasing, that they're always trying to discipline their minds in every event of the course of a day to turn towards you. And I pray that, God, you would begin to pour out your Spirit on this congregation, on each and every one of our hearts, as we get ready to go into a two-week series on the person and the presence of your Holy Spirit, may we understand that communion that you desire to have with us and the function and the power of the early church living in and through the Spirit. God, we want to be people of your presence. And we thank you that it's all been made available when Jesus hung on the cross and said, it is finished. Heavens are opened, and we can draw near in Jesus' name. And everyone said amen and amen and amen. Hey, go and have a wonderful week. Maybe get these uh, messages, go online and listen to them again, and let them speak to your heart.